know Bob Jorgensen and would like to share something about how he impacted your life. Number two is a testimony, a praise, if you will, of something that's happened with you that's a direct result of your experience on the farm or gardening. It could be an object lesson. It could be an answer to prayer, a miracle God worked for your farm, uh, some way that God touched your heart. Um, but we like to keep it confined to those two general areas. Does that all make sense so far? Cool. The last rule is, is that I'm going to hold the mic. <laughs> My pastor at home, a very smart man, knows that uh, church members get few opportunities to preach. And sometimes they like to uh, take advantage of the moment in full. So he has a habit that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal the habit from him, and that is that he holds the mic so that if you wax eloquent and feel inspired by the Holy Spirit at the moment, that, uh, that it doesn't get too far uh, out of hand. So uh, the, the other thing that we're willing to do here, now we don't have hymnals or songbooks, but if you would like to sing uh, a hymn of praise or a, a hymn that glorifies God, and we'd be willing to do that too. Uh, it would have to be a hymn that we all, all would know. I am not a chorister, and so I'm not willing this afternoon to attempt to bless you with my voice in that way. So it would have to be a song we could all sing. Um, how's that sound? Any objections? Can I get a... Yes, you... that's true. So if you have something you'd like to share, we're going to share from the front again. Uh, we have a full row of empty chairs here. You can line up in the front row, and, uh, and we'll share in line, first come, first serve, so to speak. And this is supposed to be over at 5, is that right? Okay. Any brave volunteers? Wants to be the first? Yes, sir. Come on up here, Rob. I was sitting close, so I thought I might as well go first. Um, you know, the last few years I've really had a um, wonderful experience walking with the Lord, but I've had some very, very low times. Um, for a couple of years, I struggled very, very deeply with depression. Um, kind of runs in my family. My sisters have been on at times five antidepressants and have tried to commit suicide before. But the one thing that God did to keep me, in addition to studying the Bible and studying the spirit of prophecy, was manual work. I reached a point in my education at my public high school that I went to where I was walking strong with God where my brain just didn't compute anymore. Um, things wouldn't register. I was so out of balance in my life that I just couldn't, couldn't do it anymore. And that's when God led me to be a nursing assistant and that was a great blessing. But now it's how God's led me to be involved in agriculture. What a wonderful blessing it's been, getting my hands in the soil, being able to nurture something and help it grow. That depression, boy, God's fighting that strongly with all that, and it's just been a wonderful blessing. So I want to encourage any of you that are going through a hard time, whether it's depression or other things, even struggling with things like pride, these agriculture has a humbling influence. It'll help many, many different problems in your life, and God has a solution. So don't give up hope. Amen. Rob, where are you from? I'm from Eden Valley. Eden Valley. That's where you're farming, gardening at. Yes, that's right. Great. Rob, thanks for sharing. I know it sounds overly simplistic in our extremely educated society, but it's very true. Idle hands are the... And uh, a really good cure is just to get out and work. Amen. Somebody else? Tell us where you're from here, by the way, too. Right now, I'm in the Houston, Texas area. Um, I'm a local. I uh, actually grew up on a farm in northwest Kansas. Okay. Uh, I've been away from the farm all, uh, probably almost 60 years now, and, and I intend to get back when I retire. Um, but this incident happened back when I was uh, working for my dad on a wheat farm. Now, if you know about wheat, when it comes harvest time, it, you drop everything and nothing happens except harvest. Uh, because the longer that wheat, uh, it's dry. You have to do it dry, and as long as that wheat stands in the field, the more you lose due to the grain falling on the ground. Um, if it rains, you're in trouble. 
Well, um, the neighbors always told my dad, uh, you got to harvest seven days a week. You just can't afford to lose a day of harvesting. Well, my dad uh, was not a long time Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath keeper, but it had been several years. Um, and he had determined that he was going to keep the Sabbath. He wasn't going to cut his wheat on Sabbath. And so Friday before sundown, we shut everything down and, uh, and went to the house. We went to church and um, it rained. And it rained, except it didn't rain on our place. <laughs> um, and interestingly enough, the, our neighbor, uh, uh, just the next farm east of us, um, about the time he went back into the field after the rain to start cutting, he, he had some mechanical failures on his combine. And uh, we had actually finished by that time. And we went over and helped him finish. And I, uh, I think that was probably a, a, a good witness to our neighborhood because they all began to recognize my dad as a man of faith. Amen. Amen. Well, object lesson I can think of there. Um, I've read about wheat, and I've read that that timing is really important. And um, God is perfect in his timing. If uh, the wheat gets too dry, he said, it... It, the heads shatter and you lose the, the kernels to the ground. And God does not want to lose a single person. And while you and I may be anxious and we're waiting, we're longing, we're... God is perfect in his timing. When he, when he comes, it will be because of maximum yield in his harvest. It's a great object lesson there. Ecclesiastes 11, 1 through 3. Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Give a portion to seven, and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. Now we, um, uh, my family and I, we have been raised, basically, spent most of our years in institutional work. And we were at a smaller self-supporting institution where I was managing a agriculture-related portion of the, of the place. But the Lord was directing us to move on to our own land, which remarkably, a few years before, we had acquired four miles away. So, in doing that, on the place, there was a small barn where we kept our equipment. And there was this sweet gum tree. I don't know if any of you know about sweet gums. But it's a tree that we have in the southeast. And they can get quite large. And they tend to rot out on, in the middle and go hollow. And this sweet gum had four trunks. And one of them was leaning right over the barn, and we said, what are we going to do about that? <laughs> so we had been thinking about it, but we hadn't done anything. Well, anyway, in the process of moving, it was decided that I would, that we would take part of the, uh, the nursery part of the farm business there at the institution, since I was the only one that knew how to run it. And so we were trying to decide to be, how, how generous to be, and we finally decided what we were going to do. So that morning, I knelt with my wife, and we prayed. And I just happened to claim the promise of Ecclesiastes 11.1 1 in the first part of verse 2. Give a portion to seven or even to eight. Then the family went down there to kind of work on things. And I was still working for the institution. And so when she came back from during the time we were there, there was a thunderstorm. And so when they came back in the afternoon my wife told me he said you know what happened that tree fell but instead of falling over the barn it fell across the front and did very little damage and I said wow you know what the context of the promise I claimed was about the tree so that was kind of a sign of assurance to me because I was having a hard time with it having spent most of my years not on my own. Amen. 
You thankful for the little things God does? I know we like the big ones, but uh, the little ones mean a lot along the way too. Anybody else? He asked if he could hold it. No, I said, are you going to hold it? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I misunderstood. I'm going to hold it for you. Um, this is the fifth conference, if you count the conferences that spawned this Adventist Agricultural Association. Um, I got a call. I was, at, at, I was running the farm at the Black Hills of Health and Education Center, and I got a call from a gentleman. Um, and asked me if I would come speak. And that was Bob Jorgensen. And I wouldn't be here. I, I don't think I would be here at all, actually, if he hadn't have called me that day. And I just wanted to, to take a moment to, to be thankful that this is happening and, and all the hands that went into it and sort of the history behind what the Adventist Agricultural Association is in a sense. I mean, God is the, is the director. It's his organization. But he used certain men in, in really strong, powerful ways. And, and I just, just wanted to, to sort of remember Bob and, and what he's done for us. And I think the board would agree with me that uh, you know, he was a very special person. And we were blessed to have that, that uh, to have God work through him and the guidance that he gave us. So, that's all. Amen. I'd like to expand this just a little bit. If anybody would like to offer a prayer of thanks, I think that would be perfectly appropriate as well. Uh, a lot to be thankful for here. You know, the Lord's doing things for all of us. So, I think that would be, like I said, very well appropriate. Anybody else like to share? Yeah, that'd be all right. We want to encourage anyone that... Uh, oh, real quick, I'm sorry. Uh, we asked everybody to say who you are, where you're from, real quick. Eric Rose from Southeast Oklahoma, my wife Amanda, our son Kent. We wanted to encourage anyone who is thinking about moving to the country, but it seems very daunting. This is our, our brief story. Hopefully I can keep it under one, one or two couple minutes. I'll help you if you can. Okay, great. <clears throat> Two years ago, we were renting in Kansas, and we came across this quote in Country Living. Again and again, the Lord has instructed that our people are to take their families away from the cities into the country where they can raise their own provisions. For in the future, the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. We should be now begin to heed the instruction given us over and over again. So we said, we live in the country but we're not raising our own provisions and we're renting. How can we plant fruit trees and do all this? We can't do it really if we're renting. So we didn't have any money at all actually and we figured even if we did save a little bit, the only thing that we could afford was land in maybe barren Utah or maybe the Gobi Desert. But the Lord had different plans for us, <laughs> thankfully. Amen. So, but the other key to our story is we felt that we must do everything in our power in order to accomplish this goal. So, turned off the lights, used some candles, we hung our laundry out in the line, we didn't use the air conditioner, we did everything we could to save money. We canceled cell phones, sold extra vehicles, and almost miraculously, it seemed like we kept saving more and more money. I mean, I was the only one working, my wife was at home with our son. And uh, actually, by the time he was born, which is only a couple months later, we were out of debt. And then about five months later, we had just, just less than about $5,000 saved up. And I didn't have a high-paying job at all. But, of course, still, that's almost nothing in the world's eyes. So we heard about an area in southeast Oklahoma that had no building codes, low land prices, no homeschooling laws, and uh, very rural and mountainous and had rain. And so, uh, to cut the story short, but I won't describe all of our land search, but we found this program on the computer where we could view like Google map type satellite pictures of the land and it had property lines superimposed on the map 
And I just, these were all properties, not just properties for sale. But I began scouring. I, I was sick for a day, so I, I took a day off from work because I was sick. And I, I spent a day scouring the county for 10-acre parcels that weren't in city or near cities. And, of course, these weren't for sale again. <laughs> so I found a, a couple parcels and contacted one of the ladies that owned this parcel. She lived in Texas. And I didn't even look at any properties that had houses because I knew we couldn't afford anything with a house. So I uh, called her, and she said, well, I haven't been there in 60 years, but it's a beautiful place and everything. She's like, but the bottom line is I'm, I don't want to sell it. So you hung up. And I thought, well, I'll have about 1,000 more of these phone calls until I finally find someone who's willing to sell. <laughs> But she called back at 9 o'clock the next day, 9 o'clock in the morning, and she said, I talked to my husband and we changed our mind, but we need to talk about the price. And I, you know, anything she said, I thought we couldn't afford. So she said, how about $5,000? <laughs> so we knew that would take every penny of what we had. But I told her, I, I, mean, I almost fell over backwards when she said that, but I thought, you know, I need to, we need to see the land first to make sure, you know, because we only saw it on Google Maps. So we went down there, went camping, and we saw the creek and the trees, like 70-foot tall trees, and it was just very nice, no rocks, and we thought, this is way too good to be true. So we called her back, and, and she said, well, over the weekend, I talked to my realtor. It's worth way more than what I told you. My heart sank. I was like, well, you know, we only wanted to pay cash, so... But she said, you know, what, what price did I tell you? And I said, well, you said such and such. And she said, I'm going to keep my word, and you're going to have it. <laughs> and uh, 30 days later, we had the deed to the property, and we were in a U-Haul headed for, for the land. <laughs> so actually, we, 30 days later, we had the deed. I think it was a couple more weeks before we actually moved. But we moved down there with everything we had. Uh, we lived in a tent for, I think, a month and a half. Our, our boy was only six months old. And uh, we just did what we could, and the Lord blessed. We, someone lent us a, a camper trailer. It was very small and very uncomfortable, <laughs> but it was better than nothing. And now we have a one-room house, a tiny house, kind of like uh, Nick and Kirsten have. And we, it, it seems like a palace to us Amen. after living in a tent. And uh, we just want to just, just praise God for and. Uh, in Psalms 34, 6 says, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. So. Amen. Well, I appreciate that, Eric. Um, my wife and I, well, I grew up in the Midwest. Land is a little cheaper in the Midwest. <clears throat> and we lived in Arizona for about 10 years. And uh, by the way, while I'm sharing this, remember that uh, God loves to hear your affirmations of him. Um, we're all the same way. So somebody come on up here. I know the Lord's working in a room this size. Uh, share what the Lord's doing for you. Or come up and pray. And uh, while you're coming up here, I'll finish my little appreciation here. Um, so moving to California, it's just my wife that works. Or excuse me, I work, not my wife. And land prices are really expensive in California compared to the Midwest. So... That quote there in uh, Spirit of Prophecy, the Lord will open doors for his people to move, and I appreciate hearing your story. So, come on up here. Tell us who you are. Yeah. I'm going to hold the mic, though. Okay. Hi, my name is Sandra Swoop, and my husband, Brian Swoop, over there. So, uh, we were living in uh, Loma Linda, California area. My husband being one I moved that long time. My husband... Uh, Husband was uh, last year when, as soon as my daughter graduated from the PUC, my, my husband want to move out. As soon as she graduated, he moved out in uh, Arkansas. And then right now, Clarksville, Arkansas, we are. And then he's, he was to move there. And uh, I, I was there still waiting for the kids to get uh, and settle down somewhere. And uh, I was just praying, Lord. I was just thinking and I need uh, kids to situate it they can settle and get a job or something. And just uh, I, I'm just praying and desperately, Lord, we don't know where to go. It's just and my husband uh, he's so sick of a tired of the city, so he wanna just move up. 
he, he just move out and then he went back and the kids are before he come <laughs> kids are gone because they don't want to come with us and I just pray for my kids I just pray for my kids uh, we are right now in a living at the place there's no place at a uh, I'm just, uh, we're, I'm sleeping at the uh, massage table. We're just a uh, small place and uh, just, uh, I always good test of uh, gardening because I grew up in a farm. My father is a farmer. And at uh, the same time, I want to go back to my country and then the, uh, my homeland, my father and uh, my grandparents' land, and uh, Muslim people, all these years, they was living of it. And uh, right now, we are, and my brother is working with it, and he's got to uh, hopefully pray for us and uh, restore back. I want to go there and then open up the lifestyle center and then the train there also. My oh, hold on. Tell us where you want to go. Where's homeland? My homeland is Bangladesh and the India border. And right now, you know, where we are, we were trying to want to do the small, tiny garden. And I, I, since I love the garden, and, I, and when I start a garden, I like to plant everything. <laughs> my, my husband is very particular, and you know, he likes to, in you know, order. But I, I like that too, when I, we didn't have a time. We didn't have a short time, and uh, so much rain and flood this year, so much rain and flood. And, uh, we had uh, the heirloom seed then a uh, couple of years ago we bought and uh, we want I keep planting it and the flood taking it down the run just planting it keep planting 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 and just losing it planting and that was almost a uh, lost seed Lord I have lost bit of seed and uh, I was crying crying so hard we were so working so hard and uh, my husband and uh, he worked so hard, and he and, and uh, all the tree under the tree, he uh, all the topsoil, he and a uh, wheelbarrow and bringing in and working, and he's a hard working man. He worked so hard. So we put what we can, and God is so wonderful and bless us. I, I can't thank enough God so much blessing. We did have plenty, bounty, and I came all summer. I gave, and I and I sell some love it, and uh, still I have a lot of uh, squats and uh, pumpkin. Those are so huge, huge. I have picture of some of them that I couldn't find here right now, and I remember phone. I have some tomatoes I want to show you. Those are the produce I have, all this stuff, how much God has blessed us. I share, and I show a little bit, and I can a lot. And uh, I can in a hot plant, and we don't have any stove, hot plant, and uh, electric scale. So lots of plenty, you know, and all this stuff. And I have. Uh, For those of you who can't see, it looks very nice. It does look good. <laughs> I know it's a small picture. Yeah. So God, I know, I just, you know, uh, James 1, 5 and 6. If you lack of wisdom, God said, liberally and if you ask God he will give you liberally if you and uh, and then don't doubt you uh, know if you asking God's blessing or any kind of sickness or any kind of things you want to do don't doubt a little bit and a hundred percent go forward I have so many testimony I can share tons about in uh, my life my God my husband was a God chosen husband you know only one testimony Okay. Hey, I want you to stay up here for just a second, though. Um, I'd like to ask somebody to come up here and pray. You asked us to pray for your children. Yeah. And uh, we all have children. I got two children at home. Somebody come up here and pray for our children. There's a promise in the scripture that the Lord will save our children. I think that in the context of our agricultural conference, that is the purpose, one of the purposes of farming. Can I ask for a brave soul? Pray for our children that God would use the land, like he's promised to, to save our kids. If you'll kneel with me, can I hold it? Can you kneel with me? I'll kneel. Come on, come on. Heavenly Father, Lord, I, we all come to you on bended knee. 
You are King of kings and Lord of lords, Father. You are creator of all. We all belong to you. Father, we know that our children are your children. They've been loaned to us to tend to them for you. So, Father, we lift them up to you. We place them in your hands. We ask that you would fill in for our deficiencies, for the community's deficiencies and the weaknesses that we have, and you would make up the difference that they would... You've promised, Lord, that if we put them in your hands that you would take care of them. And so I know that I'm only here in part for my mother's prayers. And so, Lord, I just lift these children up to you, everyone that's with you and those that are lost, that you would do your own mighty works that we know not of to win their souls to your kingdom. Help us to be a part of that, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on up here. Tell us who you are, where you're from. Hi, my, my name is Teresa Sherrard. I'm from Missouri. And I really don't know why I'm coming up here. I just wanted to encourage people that... Okay, no. Did you come in at the beginning? No. i got to help you. What's that? Okay, so there's two things. I need you to be short. Oh, I'm going to be short. Okay. <laughs> and we want testimonies. Yes. All right. It's a testimony. Okay. I was convicted to move to the country several years ago, and I fought it because I'm single. And, but I felt very driven, and so I, I made a deal with the Lord. I'll, I'm looking for a place how to get there. So I went to, um, I found Jerry Franklin's website about going up and learning about the country, and then I found it was in Canada. And I said, oh, no, that can't be right. And the Lord said, go, you get your passport. And I'm like, no, 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 I, I can't go there. Get your passport, get your passport. I said, okay, I'm looking at the price of the ticket, and I'm saying, no, no, no. And I said, okay, Lord, if the price of the ticket goes down, because I thought I was going to trick God, and if the price of the ticket goes down, then I will go. And the next time I look, the ticket is $200 less. And I'm like, oh, no, I've got to go. And I, so I went to Canada. I learned about country living. I was deeply convicted that country living is as big a change in your life as keeping the Sabbath. It was, it's huge. And then the Lord said, you need to go back again. And so I did. I ended up going back again. And then I was driven to keep looking for property, just keep looking. And the Lord would say, I don't, I'm not finding anything. He said, keep preparing, you know, do what you can now. You know, you don't have to have everything in front of you. You don't have everything laid out. Just do what's in front of you. So that was downsizing. Just start. And I started looking, and you, I'd have to travel eight to ten hours to drive to find properties. And eventually the Lord moved me into a place. But I'd just like to encourage anyone who thinks this is stupid. I had friends telling me, Teresa, you're stupid. Um, you cannot move to the country by yourself. I'm black. You cannot go out there by yourself. They're going to get you. And um, you can't do that. And so, <laughs> but I, I was succumbing to that thought. You know, I was like, well, I, but the Lord said, go, go, go. You must go. And um, this is an interesting story, and this will be the end. Um, I get to my little place, um, and then this big burly guy with a, white ponytail comes up to my house in a, on a motorcycle with a swastika on it or something. And I'm like, oh, Lord, <laughs> help me, help me. And he comes up and he says, hi, I'm your neighbor. I heard you were coming. And he says, and I heard um, uh, that you were a teacher or a doctor. Which one? And I said, yeah. And then he says, well, there were some friends in the neighborhood that were talking about you. But I said, she's going to be great. And I said, wow, Lord. I never saw this man, I never laid eyes on him, but he was protecting me already. And I said, so if you're discouraged or you're afraid, just trust God. It's for everyone. All of his people are meant to move out, and he will take care of every single step. Amen. Thanks, Teresa. Anybody like Teresa, you like to play games with God? You know, I've come to the conclusion that the Lord likes to play those games too. You're like, oh, really? You want to do that? Uh, okay, come on up here. Oh, yep. Yeah. Were you? Hope is not too much lesser going on up here, but I have a quick testimony. So uh, Larry and I have been saving for a greenhouse all season. Uh, we're working, moving toward me, trying to quit my job, and we recognize tomatoes do well. 
So we wanted to get a new greenhouse. So every market, we're tucking away some money, tucking away some money. So um, while we're doing this, a Mennonite family comes to visit our farm. And it's this very nice couple, and they're wanting to learn about growing organic. They're doing flowers. In their visit with us, they mention an auction that's going to be happening. And Larry and I never thought anything of it. We'd never been to an auction. So then fast forward like a month later, we're at Farmer's Market in Louisville, and this other farmer tells us about this auction in Indiana. We still don't really think much of it. Well, the day of the auction, that farmer emailed me and asked me if I was going to the auction. And I called Larry. He said, no, I'm way too busy. I can't go to an auction. So then I got to thinking about it, and I looked it up online, and they had two greenhouses for auction. And they looked like the one we were saving for. It was a 100 by 30, and it had a roll-up side. They were very, very nice. Had vents and fans and corrugated plastic doors, much higher standard than anything we ever mm -hmm. could afford. They actually had that, and they had another one that had a vented roof that was a 60 by 24. And then I looked, and this auction is like 10 minutes from our house. So then I'm, I call Larry back, and I'm like, Really, I think you should at least go and check it out, you know, mm -hmm. because it's so close. So the other cool thing is auctions usually always happen on Sabbath. Well, this was a Thursday, and it was at 5.30, so I could meet him there when I got off work. So I show up, and Larry's, like, shaking his head. He's like, I don't really like this auction thing. It's just not his thing at all. Because Larry never makes quick decisions, ever. He's like a researcher, and he thinks it through for like months at a time, and then he makes a decision. So he's just like out of his comfort zone, and then like people are talking really fast, and they're bidding against each other, and you know. Um, so it's mostly Amish and Mennonite. It's a Mennonite family going out of the flower business. So we thought, we'll just wait and see about the greenhouses. So it gets to the greenhouse part, and... The auctioneer with his microphone, you know, he says, $5,000, no one says anything. $4,000, no one says anything. $3,000, no one says anything. And so finally someone shouts out $1,000. Well, we didn't really understand this, but how it goes, the guy was explaining, is whoever wins the bid gets to pick what greenhouse they want. Hmm. So you could get the 100 by 30 or the 60 by 24, and then the other thing was, if you won the bid, you could also get both of them if you wanted for that same price. So double, right. So we were like, wow, that's kind of strange, but okay, if that's how you do it. So it gets down to us and the very nice Mennonite couple that we met. We're bidding against each other. And it was awful. Larry's face is beet red. My heart is racing. The other Mennonite family, they were very out of their comfort zone, too. You know, they're, they're new in all this, too. And he was uncomfortable, and they're, like, bidding back and forth. So anyway, to make a long story short, we ended up winning the bid, and we ended up having enough for both of them with what money we had saved, which wouldn't have even have been enough for one. We thought maybe the small one. So then we're like, wow, we have both now. What are we going to do? So we thought in our hearts we would offer the other one to the Mennonite couple. Mm -hmm. And so we approached them, and um, they were like, which one do you want? We're like, I don't know, which one do you want? And it was just really kind of, we're all just worked up, you know? <laughs> like, I don't know. And so we decided to go home and pray about it. And uh, we were thinking about it. We're like, wow, you know, we really could use both of them. We need a Starts house and a tomato house, both. So... We approached them just with honesty and asked them, you know, what one were you wanting and what were you thinking? And, you know, we could use them both, but if you need one, we were happy to sell them one. And they told us, you know, we really think that you, it's okay. You guys should keep them both. So the Lord provided us with two new greenhouses. Amen. Uh, I, uh, I just wanted to say how thankful I am that we were able to come to the convention last year, especially because of the uh, ministry of Bob Jorgensen and what a blessing it was to our family. And uh, I, I miss him this year. Um, and I, I'm hoping that somehow his materials can become more available because 
what he was sharing is so significant because we have nothing to fear for the future except we forget the way the Lord has led us in our past his and his teachings in our past history and the the things you shared were very profound so I thank the Lord that we our family had the privilege amen now some of this research takes a lot of time and I appreciate the effort that people put into uh, what they've shared here at the conference I get to hold the mic. I get to hold the mic. Sorry. Uh, well, hey, my name is Michael Krauss. I'm a junior at Daystar Adventist Academy, the academy that's uh, been here at the conference. And uh, this conference has been really, really cool to me in that I haven't had this kind of positive exposure to agriculture or anything garden related since I was little. Hold on. What do you say? Now, when I was little, it was still kind of negative in the fact that, you know, my mom used to send us boys out to the garden. I have two brothers. And she'd say, hey, go garden. And we're like, mom, how are we supposed to make this fun? And she's like, I'll tell you how. Have kids and make them do it. <laughs> and that... <laughs> and that's how I always grew up thinking of gardening or anything related to farm or even planting something green in the dirt. And so, you know, once I got older, I was like, you know, I have to go to school, Mom. I don't have time for this. And so I just, you know, wiped the slate clean of that and decided to walk away from it. Is your mom here? No. No. <laughs> she'll, she'll be seeing this eventually. Don't worry, though. Okay, all right. Um, <laughs> and uh, so then I was involved in a lot of traditional education, you know, academics, 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 nothing outside the classroom. And it was like that until I came to Daystar this past semester. And it was really weird, you know? All of a sudden, I was forced to work on a farm, but it really wasn't all that bad. And then uh, through God's providence and his blessings, we were able to come to this conference. You know, we really shouldn't have been able to come here uh, with a lot of different factors, including finance, uh, finances and transportation, but we ended up here. And it was really cool to me how we can actually integrate academics and all those other things along with agriculture and have an LNG White Bible-based balanced learning program. And through that, we can go out into the world and teach others about it. Because, you know, if we're uh, illiterate and if we don't know these other things, it's hard to talk to other people about agriculture. But um, it's shown me here that, you know, you can have both and you can still follow God's plan and you can still take his leading. And that's been really cool to me, and I really appreciate that. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Yep. And I keep forgetting myself, but tell us who you are, where you're from. I'm Paula Ryder from um, North Texas, and I want to thank Alan, Siler, and Vivian for encouraging me to come. We farm, uh, we're wheat farmers, and farm thousands of acres of wheat, several, three or 4,000 acres. And I just want to give the testimony to God today of uh, what we just found out this past week. <clears throat> We were harvesting our wheat in the spring or in the fall. We, we harvested in May. We tried harvesting it. We got a couple of fields harvested. We, Texas has had a lot of rain this year, mm -hmm. uh, 70, uh, 72 inches for our area right now. We usually get 36 a year. That's our average. And so we're 72 inches this year so far. So anyway, um, the rain came. The wheat began to sprout in the head. We weren't able to harvest our wheat. And so um, we were trying to harvest it, and the wheat had lost so much weight that we were getting a dollar a bushel. For the wheat and my husband called me and said we're pulling out of the fields we're not going to be combining i was supposed to go to the field and help them help me for just a second what's normal what's normal uh, price per bushel normal <laughs> what's or normal that's right <laughs> it fluctuates so much i mean you know but is that really bad or is that that's real that was really bad, really bad. Okay. that you couldn't pay for the diesel and what it took to put the the crop in let alone try to bring it out and we were getting so stuck in the fields that we were tearing up our equipment our combines and things were being damaged and the combines are about three hundred fifty thousand dollar equipment you know yeah and so we we pulled them out of the fields and so um we left that lay and it continued to rain considerably amount then we came off with real dry weather in july and august we went in and just um har uh, harrowed the fields and got them ready to try to do something with them this fall. And then it began to rain again. We just got nine inches three weeks ago in those areas. And so the wheat came up 
from the wheat that was left in the field. And so the fields are so full of wheat right now that we had an agronom uh, agronomics guy come out to look at it to see if it would be worth the value to let it in the field or if we should uh, till it under and start over replanting. And um, he said, oh, no, he said, let it. And they went from field to field, over 800 acres. We don't have to re-sow this right now. He said, let that set. And so God has blessed us even though, and so you have to remember, we do get insurance when the field, when we weren't able to. We pulled out, it was more... Uh, reasonable for us to pull out and get insurance money on it than to continue to harvest it. So we pulled out, took the insurance money off of that, and now not having to put the diesel money into it or anything else, to, or the seed wheat or anything else to re -sow. So I just want to say this because when we were in the class um, the day before yesterday talking about or maybe it's yesterday, the group session of what do you do when you don't have fertilizer and you can't get the rain and you can't do this and that? You trust God. He replanted our whole field for us, fields, acres for us this year when we didn't have the money and the time to go back and do it. And so um, I just want to encourage you, you know, everybody's talking about moving to the country. Those of us that have been in the country for a while, God still blesses us too, you know, in, in mighty ways. And um, I just want to encourage you, and I'm thankful for this conference because two to three months ago, my daughter and I decided we needed to start gardening. I mean, we garden ourselves, but not selling it like you guys do. And so we came with Vivian and a suggestion to learn how to do that. And so we're going to have a whole new look at farming compared to what we do do. So my daughter and I are going to start a little farm now. Amen. We've got about 14 minutes left. Um... Yeah, come on up. I want to warn you, I can talk louder than the mic, so I can talk without, and I can run faster than you. No, uh, I don't know that's true. <laughs> um, is, is Jennifer and Ken here? Uh, I, I'll have to talk for them. But uh, it's, it's talking about country living, um, I was teaching at Southern as a professor a couple of years ago, and I was reading education, and... Uh, I thought, you know, I need to just do what the Lord says. And so I uh, read that, you know, the father should spend time with his children. The best situation is with to have them with him when he works. And my boys were getting to that age where they really needed that. Uh, but I want to encourage you, uh, I'll try to do this quickly, but um, we had no money. And so my burden is for Adventists like me that I've never been good at making money. <laughs> and And you can still do it because the Lord owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And we were given 20 acres, which was a real gift, obviously, but it was 20 acres of woods. And we'd used up all our money in the moving process. You know the way moving is expensive. And uh, so I want to encourage you, if you don't have the money, um, you don't want to make rash moves, but there is money in the land. And I was able to, if you're interested in an alternate building, which I believe is really connected to agriculture in a very close way, um, we've experimented a lot with alternate building, but basically it works like this. You tear all the trees down and stand them back up and you have a house. I mean, that's what I did. Um, I have a straw bale house. Uh, but the other thing, a wonderful blessing is right near me is a lifestyle center. And I, you know, I wanted to do the blueprint. I wanted, to, Lord, if, if only I could live in the country and, and have a little uh, health place and, and do a little Bible school that would help people learn health remedies and do the farming as well. And, and where you this, is, this is a dream. It's in Spring, near Springfield, Missouri, oh, Mans right. Mansfield. Yeah. yeah. Ken and, um, and Jennifer Duffield have a little lifestyle center and they're my neighbors. And, uh, and the Lord's just been blessing them also with gifts. We just got a greenhouse to put up and, uh, I'm scared because I, I have a big mouth. And so I said, yeah, we need to have a farming program here and grow food for our patients. And Jennifer sort of looks at me and, and I'm saying, yeah, I'd like to do it. And she says, okay, let's go ahead, you know, because Jennifer is a woman of faith. And I'm like, oh no, what did I just get myself into? But the lesson I've learned is, is that God really works when you step out on that limb. And one other thing I'd say is God is going to try you when you step out on faith. And the reason he's trying you is to develop your faith, not to discourage you. But oftentimes we get discouraged because we don't understand. Remember Elijah when uh, he ran away from God and God kept following him and feeding him on the way? And he finally got to the cave and God didn't say a word to him until he got there. And then uh, God is not in the whirlwind and he's not in the, all these spectacular things. And have you ever wondered why God just spoke in a still small voice to Elijah? Because... He wants to teach us that even when things don't go as we expected, as things did not go as Elijah expected, 
And this is going to happen to you when you move to the country. And Fred, you know this too, right? The, the year your pump quit and you were hauling water and it was just t terribly hot and you begin to wonder, have I done something wrong, Lord? The still small voice means that God is even there and is in control when you think everything is going wrong. Mm -hmm. God is going to speak with a still small voice and say, trust me, there's something good. He brought the children of Israel into the wilderness to try them and to prove them whether they would do his will or no. So don't let the devil capitalize on the failures let God capitalize when you fail, and there's a great lesson to learn. So don't be afraid of failure. Don't be afraid to move out into the country. And I'm just saying that that's still small voice. God will not forsake you as long as you follow his proper methods in that. Amen. Come on up here. You got a quote for us. I do. What's your I was name? considering what to share. Faye Ann Crawford. Where are you from? Right now I'm from Alabama, but I'm originally from South America, from Guyana. Oh, and I just wanted to read one verse in the Bible that my mom often shares with me. It's in Psalm 48, and it says in verse 1 and then 14, Wait is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. And I just wanted to share... <laughs> a long testimony. But right now I'm in school for um, agriculture actually at the A&M University in Alabama. And I had always wanted to do agriculture growing up, but it was oftentimes looked at, at least in our sphere, and I was sharing this with some people in terms of academic excellence, not something that you want to do. you know. And like she was saying, you're female and they're like, okay, what are you going to do? <laughs> and this past year I decided to go back to school, but I didn't have the money, one. And I didn't even have a place to stay in terms of looking at it. But the Lord led me to Alabama A&M, and he not only provided transportation, but he also provided a family that I stayed with. And it was coming down to the end of the semester, which was in the spring, and I was considering to, if to do an internship on a farm or where to go. And my professor offered me the opportunity to work on a sustainable farming project um, with ethnic vegetables, which is a question I asked. And the challenge came up because um, it's a secular school and I was in charge of the project so we had the planning for the plantings and then harvesting mm -hmm. and one of the challenges was okay they wanted to harvest on Sabbath and I told them I cannot do that you know so we set the days we're gonna harvest on um, it was gonna be Monday Wednesday and Friday and the semester was about to start because we did that all summer and it was fine. And again, they were like, okay, we can harvest on Sabbath. And I'm like, no, we won't harvest on Sabbath. We're going to harvest on Sunday and Wednesdays because it was coming down. And initially, there was a little bit of resistance. But at the end of it, you know, they said because they had been doing this project for about the fifth year, they had never had such a well-organized program or such a large harvest. And we had so many vegetables, in fact, when the frost came, we lost some of it, but it was one of the best years that they had had. And I just want to thank God for that because, you know, honoring him, he honors us. And the blessing that came out of that, my second semester, which is this semester, was about to begin. And again, I didn't have money for school. <laughs> and um, I was about to go to help in uh, West Virginia at a health camp for two weeks I volunteered. And uh, the week before I went, I was earnestly praying about it because the semester was going to start in the mid of August. And one of my um, Adventist friends, she says, okay, why don't you go speak to the dean? And initially I went to the chair and he says, oh, we don't have money. So I went to the dean and before I got there, he says, I know who you are. And I'm like, <laughs> you know who I am, okay? <laughs> That's not too bad. And he says, go back and speak to the chair. And I went back to him and he said, oh, he didn't tell you? we're going to cover you for the semester. And I said, well, praise the Lord. You know, that was a blessing. And um, even me coming here, that's the other testimony. Um, I found out about the conference from David because actually they were going to help me on my project in the summer. And I said, well, it's Adventist. Um, initially when I had showed them the flyer, my professor says, well, this looks kind of religious, so we don't mix church and state. And... I went to the secretary and she says, you know what, it doesn't hurt if you get no, but at least you tried. 
And I said, oh, rejection. <laughs> I don't know. But God impressed me, you know, ask and it shall be given. And I went back to the chair and he said, let me think about it. Come back at the 1st of October. So I got the itinerary for the program together and I um, typed up a letter, you know, how's it going to benefit my education? And I took it into him. And that was the beginning of October. I was getting to the end of October almost. And I found out that the dean approved it and he, the chair approved it. And not only that, because then they approved it, but I had to find a way of getting here and then to pay for registration. And my professor said, oh, where do you want to go? You know, we have some money for travel and you can use it. We haven't used it all year. And that was one thing. So I went back to the secretary and she says, oh, why don't you ask the chair? Because he has some money for travel too and he didn't use his. And I, <laughs> I went back to him and he says, yeah, I can give you $200. Well, he didn't see the price for my, um, the registration to come here. Mm -hmm. And initially when I had checked it up on Advent Source, I had checked the wrong um, accommodations. So it was like a hundred and some. And when I went back the next time, it was exactly $200. And I said, whoa, thank you, Father. It wasn't too much or it wasn't too little. And it was exactly what I needed. And I just want to thank God because in honoring him, as she says, he honors us. Amen. And it has been a blessing being here. Amen. Thank you for sharing. Got uh, time for a couple more. I'd like to have, um, after you share, I'd like to have a couple people pray for us. Uh, prayer of thanks. Be short and to the point because we're going to stop in just a few minutes here. Um, you want just... I get to hold it. Okay. Um, so I'm a student from Daystar Academy, just like Michael that was talking a little bit ago. I'm from South America, Chile, actually. Um, my mom there bought, and my parents bought a farm and they're doing like um, health seminars and like a health weekends and everything so people will help heal from stop them smoking and then from any like diseases they have and we try to help them with a healthy like lifestyle and I don't I didn't really enjoy it that much it's not like my favorite thing to do so <laughs> and then I went to Daystar and I started working you know on the farm so sometimes on Sundays and everything and I still didn't like it that much but uh <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so we we, I heard about this conference where we were in chemistry class and they told us, hey, you know, we could go there. And we started getting our funds and everything and we were actually $2,500 short. And so what we did is started grabbing and making CSA boxes and going out just to the valley and just giving them out on a donational basis. And actually in like two days, we got all the money we needed except for like $150. Amen. And so I was like really impressed, like, whoa, you know, we got a ton of money. Even like if we would sell them for the money that we were supposed to sell them, we probably wouldn't have made like as much, but some people gave me like $50, $70 for just one box. So it was a really awesome experience. And then, yeah, we also made the wheatgrass cart and the cutting boards to help pay for this too. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I really, I really saw, like I'm starting to like farming and everything, wheatgrass. It was actually, I must admit, you know, Mr. Sean, if he's here, <laughs> he's my work supervisor. <laughs> I'm starting to enjoy farming a little bit. So, <laughs> yeah. So you went, Door to door. Yeah, we went door to door. With CSA boxes. How much did you raise? Uh, we raised 23.50, I think. Amen. So, yeah, we were really close. Door to door is hard enough. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. But uh, that's pretty cool. 2,500 bucks almost. Okay, I got a couple more people up here. We're out of time, so I need you to be really short. If you can do that for me. I just want to give a testimony. My name is Rudy Harnish from British Columbia, Canada. There came a time when our son got old enough to learn a trade, and I asked him, what do you want to do? I said, he wants to be a, a log home builder. I said, okay, we're packing up the, the, uh, the work for a while. We're going to spend some time and we'll take you one of the best log home builders, which we did in Crozeness Pass. That was several years ago. And then we asked our daughter, who's here today, Laura, what do you want to do? She says, Dad, I want a garden. I said, okay, where do we go to garden in B.C.? Well, the best place is in Creston, B.C., so we packed up again, moved to Creston. We always tried to buy land in Crowsness Pass, could never get anything. This year, sold our place up north, and uh, land became available very, very reasonable. Nobody wanted it because it was wooded and it was scary, but we got there, looked around. This is one of the greatest places we could ever ask for. Garage is being built. We're moving in <clears throat> in a couple of weeks and uh, building our home. Our son is building the home, and Laura's fulfilled her dream. She's gardening. 
So we're here to, she told me, Dad, we got to go to this because we want to build a greenhouse. We want to know how to do it right. Amen. It's funny the things the Lord uses to scary for us. <laughs> Come on up here. But praise the Lord. It, it's amazing how he works, huh? I'm Roy Bain from Atlanta, Georgia. I knew Bob Jorgensen very, very well. Um, he'd come to our church once a month, if not twice a month, and present messages that I've never heard before. Um, he stayed at our house. My wife and, and my, our house, we, he stayed at our house um, for the weekend for two solid years. And when I found out that he had died, it, it just shocked me to no end. As we were seeing this afternoon, a, we were singing a song, a Bible scripture, and I want to read this because I think it, it should mean a lot to every one of us. It says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for well-being and not for calamity, in order to give you a future and a hope. When you call out to me and come and pray to me, I'll hear you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. That was Bob. Bob gave his very life for anybody that needed it. His message was, seek God with all of your heart. And when you search for him with all of your heart, he's there for you. Now we're talking about the garden, we're talking about mood in the country. That's all great. But if it doesn't get us prepared for what's coming, the calamity, um, the economic situations coming, the spiritual calamity that's going to be coming upon us, what good does it do, brothers and sisters? It doesn't do any good at all. Um, I really enjoyed this, this conference this week because, well, on several reasons, but one big reason was because when it comes to the eight laws of health. I'm going to ask you to be short. This is very short. Okay. I'm almost right. done. Okay. When it comes to the eight laws of health, well, the main one is, is sleeping. And this conference was very, very much in the forefront of making sure that we got out in time to get our rest. And I appreciate that. Amen. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll get her first here. Come on up. I'm Eileen Youngberg from Honduras, Central America, in Texas. And the main thing I want to say is thank you for this conference. From the time I was five years old, my maternal grandfather was a physician. However, his passion was agriculture. He always kept a hole in the trunk of his car and a pair of boots. And he had cotton fields and other things. And he would go out there whenever he could. He spent his life savings founding a school in Honduras. So we started out 55 years ago, very agricultural. And in the last 25 years, we've had so many challenges. We have not been able to keep that up. And I just simply cannot say how much I appreciate knowing where I can get the resources because you know we're trying to get the agricultural going again and to be able to answer people that only want to throw these chemicals at you. And so I just appreciate I, that there's so much. Mm -hmm. And I just pray that God will continue to bless you so you can continue to bless us. Amen. I want you to stay up here for a second, too. We'll, we'll close with a prayer for you and your school. Um, One more. <clears throat> when we were missionaries in Turkey for 10 years, and after that, my mom and dad started kind of feeling that we should move back to the U.S. because my grandma was getting kind of um, less strength because she had cancer and just different other issues. And so for like a um, little less than a year, we were praying um, that we could find a place uh, in America that would be, that we would be able to have a garden and chickens and so on. And um, my brother and I were just really praying because we wanted we really wanted to have a garden and things, and God blessed us, and we found a place in Lincoln, Nebraska, right next to my grandpa, and we've got six acres there, and a little goat, and some chickens, and a farm, so it's really great. Amen. Prayer really works. Amen. Amen. 
Come back up here for just a second. Your school's in Honduras. Mm -hmm. yeah, what's the name of the school? Uh, Centro Educacional Adventista is a school my grandfather started, but they gave that to the conference. And we have, <clears throat> my father was also a physician. He started a medical project next door. That's what we run. And we have a vocational school, and we're trying to teach, ag we, we, we have a small agricultural program at the vocational school, and we're trying to get a curriculum together and uh, expand that. We have a piece of land on the main road that we has been laying. We haven't used it for, for 30 years because we have it saved because we want a demonstration garden. We didn't want to let anybody put a no good garden there. We want a garden that people that driving by will look at it and we want to associate it with a place where we sell seeds and give, and give advice because there's a lot of malnutrition there mm -hmm. and so that's the way we want to help. The, the people in Honduras don't eat very much vegetables at all. So here's what I'd like to do. i close with prayer. We've just listened to an hour's worth of things that the Lord's done for us. And there's a couple hours more worth of stories sitting right here at a minimum. So I'd like everybody to, um, I can't say the name of the school in Spanish, I'm sorry. Okay, but the Lord knows anyway. So, um, But I'd like to pray for you and uh, challenge God to give you a story to tell us next year or the year after. And just in general, um, there'll be more stories to be told next year. There's a lot of prayer requests right here. There's a lot of people trying to push forward and this should be encouraging to all of us. God's pushing behind us. I, Let me say one thing. It's brief. If a young man at ASI in Michigan, I sat next to him, and he's the one that told me about this conference. I don't know who he is, but anyway, I just appreciate it, or I wouldn't even know about it. Amen. All right. Would you bow your heads with me for prayer? Father in heaven, I want to thank you. You've done great stuff. Many things. More than could be counted and the uh, unfortunate thing is, is that we probably forget too many of them. But Lord, uh, I, I want to I lift this last hour to you, an hour of thanksgiving. And Lord, we want to come back here next year um, and hear that you've done better things. Uh, Lord, you've said in, in, I believe it's Acts of the Apostles, that the work will not finish with less of a manifestation of God's power your power than it began with. Lord, it is, it is my request as we've lifted up thanks to you today that you would demonstrate the truthfulness of that statement by working in this school in Honduras, by working with each one of us here, the different institutions represented, the local gardens and churches and whoever else is here, whoever's been watching on the internet too, so that next year what's shared is greater than what you've done this year. So, Lord, um, what can we say but thank you? What can we say but blessed be your name? In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.